The battle for PS5 Pro vs gaming PCs continue. Will the PC master race survive? And most importantly, will they be able to swallow the hard pill of truth? Find out today at Daily Hub Ranks. I'm your host, Coretta Kelly, um, I mean Ashley. Join me as we uncover the latest in the PlayStation Master of Master Races. I say there's a place for us, but maybe, maybe it's just another pipe dream. Maybe, maybe I'm fooling myself again. Well, wh why don't you, why don't you go and find out yourself? Send me a postcard. Go on, there's the door. You can do better. Let's see how far you get. No takers? Fine. We get one thing straight. You're staying. This isn't a democracy anymore. I'm confused as to how she's comparing a first-party game visuals to a multi-platform game's visuals. That's about as disingenuous as it gets when comparing games on the PS5. That entire argument holds no weight when you consider one was solely developed to max on platform's capabilities. The other is designed to run on a multitude of varying hardware. Saying she expected more is about as asinine as believing a politician at face value. Yes, you are confused, so I got the perfect answer for this comment. Red Dead Redemption 2 Multi-Platform Masterpiece Yesterday we looked at Black Myth system requirements for the PC and today we're gonna look at the upcoming port of God of War Ragnarok. Alright, let's break down how the system requirements for for this game give us a solid hint about how powerful the PS5 Pro could be potentially rivaling some serious PC hardware like the RTX 3080 and 4070. So, looking at the Ragnarok requirements, the game has different tiers depending on the resolution and frame rate you're aiming for. To hit 4K at 60 FPS on ultra settings, you're looking at needing an RTX 4070 Ti, or an AMD RX 7900 XT. These are heavy hitters in the GPU world, designed to handle top-tier gaming with all the bells and whistles. Now, the main selling point of the PS5 Pro is to be aiming for that same sweet spot, 4K gaming at 60 FPS with advanced graphical features like ray tracing. If the PS5 Pro can deliver that, it would need to be in the same ballpark as those GPUs. This isn't just speculation, either. When you consider the PS5's current performance and how it's already able to deliver 4K at 60fps in many games, the Pro version would naturally push that even further. If Sony wants to justify the Pro in the name, they're going to have to give us a console that competes with mid- to high-end gaming PCs. So someone wrote in the comments yesterday, something like, the PS5 Pro will have the same CPU as the PS5, how can you be sure about this performance increase? And I will hit two birds with with one rock here. The second comment, where do you get this information from? How are you so sure about all this? Well, my friend, take a sit. The PS4 Pro also had the same CPU architecture as the base PS4. In the beginning, people downplayed the PS4 Pro exactly for this reason. But with time, more and more games benefited from PS4 Pro enhanced gaming label, and it doubled the FPS from 30 to 60. Also, it had a uh, had a handful of games that ran at even 4K, the CPU argument is kind of weak, in my opinion. To answer the second comment, how do I know all this? For more than a year, I studied and researched all the leaks about the PS5 Pro. Not only that, but I actually learned so much about the tech in this period, and my goal is to bring the truth. And you can call it clickbait and this and that. But so many people were wrong about the PS4 and PS4 Pro in the past that I see how funny it is that history is repeating itself again. I don't really care if you believe it or not. The amount of information I share on this channel is ridiculous. Some people choose to watch and listen and when they actually go and fact check a lot of the things that I say, they realize I'm right. Why do you think so many people waited until the PS5 Pro to come out before upgrading from the PS4 Pro? Why do you think that is? Because the architecture of the PS4 Pro was so good. A PS4 Pro played God of War Ragnarok better than a mid-gen gaming PC that you built in 2016. It's all there guys, use Google search or something. And remember, the RTX 3080 and 4070 Ti aren't just good GPUs. They're built to handle the latest and greatest in gaming technology, including ray tracing, DLSS, and more. If the PS5 Pro can match that level of performance, it would be a massive win for console gamers, especially when you consider the price difference. While a rig with an RTX 4070 Ti could set you back a couple of grand, a PS5 Pro would likely be much more affordable. I will say this again. We are not comparing raw horsepower here. We specifically talking game optimization here. But I don't want to rant about this for any longer, there is more PlayStation news to cover for the PlayStation fans. I get this question a lot and I see Xbox fans screaming in the comment section misinformation, but I don't blame them because they are not well informed. So the big question of the day is, will Elder Scrolls 6 come to PS5? Yes. 
it's likely that Elder Scrolls 6 6 will come to PS5. Here's why. Microsoft's acquisition Activision Blizzard and Bethesda FTC lawsuit. Microsoft's acquisition of Bethesda has sparked a lot of discussion about game availability. Federal Trade Commission did scrutinize Microsoft's $68.7 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard, focusing on concerns about competition and market dominance. As part of the regulatory scrutiny, Microsoft did make commitments to ensure that popular games like Call of Duty would remain available on PlayStation consoles. This was a key factor in the approval process. What if Microsoft doesn't keep their end of the promise to the FTC? Failing to honor regulatory commitments could lead to legal action from regulatory bodies or other stakeholders. This might result in fines, forced divestitures, or other remedies aimed at restoring competitive balance. Microsoft might face challenges in future acquisition approvals or other regulatory processes as a history of non-compliance could impact their reputation with regulators. Affected parties, including competitors or possibly even consumers, could file lawsuits alleging that Microsoft's actions violate antitrust laws or the terms of the acquisition approval. With Xbox consoles not selling as quickly as they'd hoped, it makes sense for Microsoft to release major titles like Elder Scrolls VI on other platforms, including PS5, to reach a broader audience and boost revenue. I just revenue. came across Sony's financial results for Q1 of fiscal year 2024, and it's actually pretty interesting. Overall, things are looking good, even though hardware sales took a bit of a hit compared to last year. Here's the scoop. First off, despite the dip in hardware sales, Sony's overall sales were up by 2% compared to last year, raking in $2.5 billion, with a net income of $1.6 billion which is an 8.2% increase. Not bad, right? The real star here is the Game and Network Services division, which saw a 12% bump, bringing in $5.89 billion. Of that, software sales alone accounted for $3.3 billion, showing almost 20% growth year over year. Plus, add-on content sales shot up by 37%, which is a big deal. Now, about hardware sales. PS5 moved 2.4 million units this quarter, down from 3.3 million last year. That's a 27% decrease, which might sound worrying, but there are some reasons behind it. For one, the PS5 price has only gone up, which naturally slows demand as the console ages. On top of that, the PS4 is still going strong, giving casual gamers less reason to upgrade, especially since the first-party output from PlayStation has been a bit slow recently. Despite the drop in hardware sales, Sony still reported 116 million active users on PS4 and PS5 combined, which is up from last year. So, while some folks might try to spin this as bad news, especially compared to what's happening with competitors, Sony's actually doing pretty well. They've even adjusted their forecast upwards by 3% because of the positive trajectory. A lot of people are concerned about the dip in hardware sales, but it's important to remember that the PS5 is still performing well, especially when you consider the challenges like hardware shortages and the pandemic that the PS4 didn't have to deal with. In fact, the PS5 is tracking pretty closely to the PS4 at the same point in its life cycle, and it's still going strong. Looking ahead, as more first-party titles roll out and we get closer to the launch of the PS5 Pro, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a drop in the cost of the PS5, making it more attractive for those still on the fence. Plus, having a premium option like the PS5 Pro could really set Sony up for a strong 2025 and beyond. Sony Group has recently outlined its vision for PlayStation Studios, emphasizing the need to consistently and continuously release successful games. This comes as part of a broader strategy to refine development processes and optimize release schedules within the company. Although 2024 has yet to see a major first-party blockbuster from PlayStation, the company has a few smaller titles lined up for release this fall, including Conquered, Astrobot, and LEGO Horizon Adventures. These games are part of Sony's ongoing effort to deliver quality content and keep the PlayStation ecosystem thriving. Man, I'm seriously disappointed about this Spider-Man 2 DLC delay. It feels like we've been left hanging for ages. I was really looking forward to diving back into the story, especially after all the hype from the main game. Insomniac has been teasing us with those smaller updates, like new suits and the new Game Plus mode, but they're just not scratching that itch for more story content. 
What makes it worse is that the last Spider-Man game got its story DLC not long after release, so I figured we'd be swinging into some new missions by now. But here we are with Insomniac staying quiet and fans like us just stuck waiting. Plus, with that ransomware attack and the layoffs earlier this year, it feels like the whole situation has just dragged on longer than it should have. I get that good things take time and maybe they're just making sure the DLC is polished, but it's tough not to feel a bit let down when you've been eagerly waiting for something that seems to keep slipping further away. I just hope when it finally drops, it blows us away and makes up for all this waiting. Have you heard about the first Berserker, Kazan? It's this new action RPG that's coming out and it's got some pretty cool stuff going on. It's based on the lore from the MMORPG Dungeon Fighter Online, so if you're into that world, you're in for a treat. So here's the deal. You play as Kazan, this badass general from the Pelos Empire. He gets framed for treason and ends up being tortured and exiled. Now he's gotta dig deep and remember all his old skills to get revenge and clear his name. It's like this epic quest for redemption and justice. The gameplay looks awesome too, it's fast-paced and kind of reminds me of Lies of P. You know, with the quick movements and intense combat. You've got to be on your toes with perfect blocking and dodging. Plus, there's a bunch of different weapons and gear you can mess around with to fit your playstyle. They just finished a focus group test in Korea, but we haven't seen any of that footage yet. It's still a work in progress, but it sounds like things are shaping up nicely. Visually, the game is blending realistic and anime-inspired graphics, which is pretty unique. Wow. Check out these videos.